Welcome. In this video, we'll be discussing soundness of natural deduction for propositional logic. Essentially, what this means is that if we start with true hypotheses, then a natural deduction proof will only prove true formulas. In other words, the rules we chose for the natural deduction system are somehow good rules in the sense that they are truth preserving. So if we start with true formulas, then those rules will produce more true formulas for us. To make these ideas precise, we'll need the following definition. So we let sigma be a signature. Remember, this just means that sigma is a set of some symbols which we'll use for the atomic propositions occurring in our formulas. Next, we let capital gamma be a set of LP sigma formulas. And finally, psi is just itself an LP formula. The first thing we'll do in this definition is we'll extend the notion of being a model from just a formula to an entire set of formulas. So recall from the last video that a sigma structure A is said to be a model for a formula if that formula is true in that sigma structure. We now say that a sigma structure A is a model for an entire set of formulas gamma if a is a model for every formula occurring in that set. If you remember, a sigma structure is just an assignment of truth values to each symbol occurring in the signature sigma. So in other words, we're assigning truth values to all of the atomic propositions that we're going to be using to build formulas. And now, such a sigma structure A is a model for capital gamma well, if that truth assignment on atomic propositions makes every formula phi occurring in gamma true. The next part of the definition introduces the idea of a semantic sequent. So we write that gamma models psi if every model of the set gamma is also a model for the formula psi. Unpacking this a bit, what this means is that well, for any model, so that's a sigma structure A, that makes all of the formulas in the set capital gamma true, well, such a model will also make the formula psi true. And this type of semantic sequence is in fact precisely what we'll need to express the idea I was talking about before. So we want to say that whenever we have a sigma structure that makes all of the formulas in our hypotheses true, and moreover, we can prove some formula, let's say psi, from these set of hypotheses using natural deduction, then we also want that that sigma structure makes psi true. Finally, we'll write uh, this here, namely that gamma does not model psi if this uh, statement does not hold. In other words, this is saying that there exists some sigma structure A, which is a model for gamma, meaning that all of the formulas in gamma are true if we interpret them in that sigma structure. But on the other hand, psi is not true in that sigma structure. Another way of thinking about this is that there's somehow an assignment of truth values to atomic propositions that's somehow a counterexample in the sense that it makes all of the things in gamma true but does not make psi itself true. Okay. With that, we're now ready to state the soundness theorem for natural deduction. So it says that if gamma entails psi, then we have also that gamma models psi. Now this statement is very compact, but let's unpack it a bit in order to make sure that we understand what it means. So this first part here, gamma entails psi, means that there exists a natural deduction proof that proves the formula psi based only on assumptions in gamma. Okay, and on the other hand, this second thing here was defined just before. So it means that for any sigma structure A that is a model for the set gamma, meaning that all of the formulas in gamma are true in that sigma structure, well, if we have such a sigma structure, then also psi is true in that sigma structure. And this should hold for any possible sigma structure which makes all of the formulas in gamma true. So the compact way of saying this is that every model of gamma is also a model for psi. And now what soundness is saying is that 
if we have a natural deduction proof of psi based on assumptions in gamma, then also every model of gamma is a model of psi. Or another way of thinking about this is that, well, in that case, whenever we have an assignment of atomic propositions that makes all of the formulas in gamma true, then that assignment will also make the formula psi true. And this is a way of saying that natural deduction proves true formulas from true assumptions. OK, so let's now move on to the proof. So I won't be giving the entire proof because there are a lot of cases to check. Basically, there is a case for every natural deduction rule. And when I introduced those rules in the video on natural deduction and in the video on informal proof theory, I sort of always explained why the rules make sense. And essentially, that argument is the argument for soundness of the rules. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you what the structure and idea behind the proof is. And then I'll just cover three of the difficult cases and leave the remaining ones as something for you to think about. Now, if you look at this statement, we're going to try to prove something that starts with a specific derivation and then conclude something about the truth values of the formulas involved. Now, because we'll be ranging over derivations, we'll be proceeding by induction on something called the height of a derivation. So I'll briefly need to explain what this height is. Remember that a derivation was defined as a rooted tree whose leaves were formulas that occurred in the set gamma and whose root was the conclusion psi. And moreover, at each node in the tree, we're using a natural deduction rule. For instance, we might consider the following derivation. So let's say I first I use axiom to get phi and psi like this. And now I combine these two using and introduction to get phi and psi. And now I uh, introduce a new hypothesis, which is chi. I uh, now use the introduction rule for implication. So I get to discharge uh, chi here. So that's what I'm doing uh, like so. And the result I get is that chi uh, implies phi and psi like this. Now the tree that corresponds to this derivation is the following. So we have um, our two leaves here corresponding to our undischarged assumptions phi and psi. And then we use the introduction rule here, the and introduction rule like that at this node. And then at the next node we use the implication introduction rule and uh, well, that's going to be the last uh, node there because that represents then our uh, final formula. And here we also need the additional assumption chi, which we have, however, uh, discharged. So while we were drawing derivations in this style in the video on natural deduction, in the background, we can always think of a derivation as a rooted tree like this, whose assumptions are the leaves of the tree, and some of them might be discharged, and whose nodes here are applications of natural deduction rules and the root corresponds to the conclusion of the derivation that we're proving. All right, so now that we know how to think of a derivation as a rooted tree, we're now going to define the height of a derivation as, well, the height of the rooted tree that corresponds to it. And now the height of a rooted tree is just the length of the longest path you can find going from the root of the tree to any one of its leaves. For instance, the height of this tree here is 2 because I can find a path of length 1, 2 going from the root to this leaf. And that's, in fact, also the longest path I can find. So the height of a derivation is just the length of the longest path that we can find going from the root of the derivation to some leaf of the derivation. And if you look at this tree here, you see it somehow has three layers. And this first layer here would be of height 0, the second one would be of height 1, and the third one would be of height 2. Now, because every derivation is basically just one of these rooted trees, we can define a height for it. And this is a natural number, so we can perform induction on it. We can now start by proving the base case, which is that the height of the derivation in question is 0. So height um, 
equals zero. Okay, what does this mean? Well, uh, then our derivation uh, will have the following form. So if it's going to be a height zero derivation, it just consists of a single uh, node like this, which is simultaneously the root and the only leaf of the tree. And moreover, if it's going to be a derivation of the form gamma entails psi, then this conclusion here has to be psi. Now, moreover, if this derivation, which maybe I call D, so moreover, if D uh, proves the sequent, so the sequent that gamma entails psi, well then, well, all of the assumptions in this derivation have to lie in the, in the set capital gamma. That's just the, the definition of what this sequent means. So in particular, the only assumption we have here, namely psi, will also lie in the set capital gamma. This is just because this uh, derivation here is a derivation that derives psi from itself. So it's simultaneously the conclusion and the hypothesis of this derivation. Okay, so now in this base case, we need to check that the statement holds. So if, well, gamma entails psi, and this is shown by some derivation d of this form of height zero, well, then we know that uh, psi occurs in the set capital gamma. And now we need to use this information in this case to show that the set gamma models the formula of psi, which just says that every model of gamma is also a model of psi. Okay, so let um, A be a model of uh, the set gamma. So what does this mean? Recall from the definition of being a model for a set gamma that this just means that the sigma structure A models every formula occurring in gamma. Okay, so then A is a model for every formula phi occurring in gamma. In particular, it's also going to be a model for this formula psi, which is an element of gamma. So A is a model of uh, psi, because psi is an element of gamma. With that, we've checked the base case. So whenever we have the situation where gamma entails psi, and this is proved by a derivation that has height zero, then that derivation necessarily is of this form here, which has conclusion psi and also its only assumption psi. Well, in that case, because this derivation proves the sequent, we know that all of its assumptions have to lie in gamma. In particular, the assumption psi lies in gamma. And well, in this case, if you take a model A for the set gamma, then A is a model for every formula occurring in gamma, in particular, it's a model of this formula psi occurring in gamma. And so we've shown that uh, at least for derivations of height zero, this statement holds. We now move on to the general case. So in this general case, the derivation so D um, that proves the sequent that gamma entails psi. So in this case, it has height um, that we call k, which is strictly greater than zero. Now, because of our induction, we can assume that any derivation that has height strictly less than k satisfies the statement in the theorem. So by induction, We may assume that um, any derivation of height strictly less than k um, satisfies the theorem. Okay. Now, the way we're going to proceed further is we're going to see what the last rule is that we applied in our derivation D.
And based on that last rule, we'll split into cases. So let um, R be the last rule applied uh, in our derivation D. So that's the rule that uh, occurs at the root of the derivation. And now we want to show that regardless what this last rule R is, that the statement of the theorem holds. And for this, we're allowed to also use this inductive hypothesis here. So essentially, we'd have to check for each natural deduction rule, we'd have to check that the statement of the theorem holds. But we now additionally get uh, this information here in the inductive hypothesis. Now, because there's a lot of rules for natural deduction, I'm not going to prove uh, soundness in each case. I'll just uh, do three cases, and then hopefully you'll see the pattern and be able to uh, think about the other cases if you want on your own. Let's start with the first one of these cases that we'll look at, which is that R is equal to the introduction rule for implication. Okay, so in this case, D has the form. So we'll be uh, basically just copying down the rule for uh, the introduction rule from natural deduction. So remember that in that case, D had the following form. So we have some derivation D prime that derives some formula chi from a set of assumptions, let's say gamma, but maybe also, uh, well, uses this assumption uh, phi here. And we use the introduction rule. So that's uh, like this. And then we get to conclude that phi implies chi. And we also get to remove um, this assumption here from our uh, hypotheses. OK, so because we know that uh, the last rule we applied was this introduction rule, we have to be in basically this situation, which allowed us to apply that rule. Now, in this case, we can conclude that this derivation d prime, so everything but this last introduction rule, this will have height strictly less than d because we're removing the root of the tree d. And this means that the longest path from d prime from its new root, which is now chi, has to be strictly less than the longest path from the old root in d um, to the leaf. So then uh, d prime has height strictly less than k because we're removing the root from d to get to d prime. Or another way of thinking about this is that, well, take the longest path occurring in d prime from this root chi to one of the leaves. Well, in d, you have a strictly longer path because you can go an additional step down here to the new root. So that shows that the height of d is strictly greater than the height of d prime. Moreover, we know something about assumptions of d prime. So we know that all of the assumptions of d prime will lie in the set of gamma unioned this additional assumption phi, which we might have discharged. So uh, and its assumptions lie in the set gamma unioned with this additional assumption phi. OK, so we now want to prove the statement of the theorem for D based on some information we have about D prime. So recall that the statement of the theorem was something like gamma entails the formula psi. So this should imply that gamma models the formula psi. So we're now in the situation where we've assumed that we have a derivation that proves this sequence. And now we need to show that, well, gamma models the formula psi. So psi in this case is now this uh, compound formula phi implies chi. And recall what this means is that for every sigma structure, which is a model of the set gamma, this sigma structure should also be a model of the formula psi. So we now choose such a sigma structure that is a model for gamma. So let A be a model uh, for the set gamma. Okay, so this means that under the assignments that A makes on atomic propositions, every formula in gamma becomes true. And we now need to show that this sigma structure A here will also be a model for psi, which in this case is this compound formula uh, phi implies chi. 
So let's suppose for the sake of contradiction that A is actually not a model of this formula. So suppose um, that A is not a model for um, this formula here. So what does this mean? So I, this means that A star of this formula uh, is equal to false. So now, when does this happen? Well, for this, we need to think back to the definition of this extension A star. So an implication is false if and only if the hypotheses here have truth value true, whereas the conclusions have a truth value of false. Okay, so then we know that A star of phi must be true, and also A star of chi must be false. All right, but now we know that A is a model for uh, gamma here, and we also now know that A is a model for the formula phi. So hence, A is a model for also for the set gamma unioned with this formula phi. And now we can apply what we know about the derivation d prime. So by induction, we know that uh, this type of soundness holds for all derivations that have a height that are strictly less than k. In particular, it holds for d prime. And we know that d prime is a derivation of the formula chi from the assumptions gamma unioned uh, phi here. Okay, so now since d prime uh, proves that the set gamma unioned with phi entails uh, the formula chi, uh, we conclude that also, well, gamma unioned uh, this thing here uh, models chi because the theorem holds for d prime. And, well, hence, what this means is that, well, if A here is a model for uh, these formulas occurring in the, on the left of this uh, semantic sequent, then also A has to be a model for the thing occurring on the right. So this means that um, A star of chi is actually equal to true. All right, but up here we assumed that uh, A star of chi was equal to false. So this is a contradiction. And hence the assumption that A is not a model for this formula here can't be true. Okay, so in this case here, the, the theorem holds. Since this might have been a bit confusing, I'll just go through the argument again. So we're in this case assuming that our derivation, which proves uh, this sequent here, has height k. And moreover, we're assuming that the last rule it uses is this uh, implication introduction rule. And in this case, we can say that our derivation has this form here because we've applied this uh, introduction rule. And in order to apply that rule, you have to be in this situation. And now we've noticed that, well, there's this subderivation here occurring in the rule, which is a derivation which has height strictly less than k, so strictly less than the height of this entire derivation here. And therefore, the inductive hypothesis applies to this derivation d prime. Now we know that the assumptions of d prime all lie in this set here, gamma unioned this additional assumption phi. And we now want to show that any model A of the set gamma is also going to be a model for the conclusion of D, which is that phi implies chi. And for this, we proceed by proof by contradiction. So we suppose that A is indeed not a model for this formula. So what would this mean? It would mean that, well, the truth value of this formula in the structure A, so A star of this formula, is false. And this can only happen by the definition of how we define truth values for formulas if the truth value of the hypothesis of this formula, so phi, is true, but the truth value of the conclusions is false. Now, because the truth value of phi is assumed to be true in this case, and we also know that A is a model of gamma, which means that A uh, makes every formula here in gamma hold, 
we can now conclude that A is in fact a model for this larger set, gamma unioned with the formula phi. Finally, we observe that the subderivation d prime, which has height strictly less than k, proves the sequence that gamma unioned phi entails chi. And because this uh, derivation satisfies the soundness by induction, we conclude that in fact also the semantic sequence holds for d prime, namely that uh, the set gamma unioned phi models chi. In other words, whenever we have a sigma structure A, which makes all of the formulas occurring in this this set here true, then also chi needs to be true. But on the other hand, A is in fact such a sigma structure, so this means that chi has to be true in A, and this is a contradiction to the fact that, well, up here we said that chi has to be false in A in order for this uh, implication to fail in A. Hence the situation where we have such a sigma structure that is a model for all the formulas in gamma, but is not a model for uh, this implication, this can't occur. And thus we've shown that in uh, this case here, where our last rule was the implication introduction, we have that the theorem holds. We now move on to the next representative case, which is that the final rule we applied was in fact the elimination rule for implication, like so. So in this case, our derivation D will have the following form. So D will consist of some derivation D1 of some uh, formula, let's say phi, from uh, some assumptions, let's call them uh, delta here, and of a second derivation D2, which derives uh, the implication phi implies psi, like this, from some other assumptions, let's call them delta 1 here and delta 2, like so. And now we're applying the elimination rule for implication. And what this gives us is just uh, the conclusion uh, psi. So again, d1 and d2 will have height strictly less than the height of d d1 and d2 have height uh, strictly less than k. And moreover, we have that uh, delta1 and uh, delta2 are both subsets of the, the set of assumptions gamma. The reason for this is that, well, the derivation d here, so this entire thing, only uses assumptions occurring in gamma. So in particular, all the assumptions we use in D1 and D2 also have to lie in the set gamma. So again, we want to now prove the statement of the theorem in this case. So that was something like uh, gamma entails psi implies that gamma models psi. Now in this case, psi is actually just the formula psi. So we let um, A be a model um, of gamma, so this means that it's a sigma structure that makes every formula in gamma true. And we now need to show that A is also a model of the formula psi occurring here. So now since we have uh, these inclusions here, so delta 1 and delta 2 are both subsets of gamma, we know that also A makes every formula in delta 1 and in delta 2 true. So since delta 1 and delta 2 are subsets of gamma, uh, we know that A is a model uh, for, for both uh, delta 1 and delta 2. And now moreover, by induction, we know that this uh, soundness theorem here holds for the derivations D1 and D2. So hence, uh, by induction, So that's applying the theorem of soundness to D1 and D2. We know that also A has to be a model for the conclusions of these two uh, derivations. So A is a model of uh, both the formula phi and also of the formula phi implies psi. 
We now consider the truth table for phi implies psi. So here we have two formulas we're starting from, and then we have this implication here. So there's the case where phi is true and psi is true, phi is true, psi is false. And then there's these other cases where uh, phi is false. So in the first two cases here, we have a one. So if the hypotheses are true and the conclusions are true, then the implication is true. And if the hypotheses are true and the conclusions are false, then the implication is false. And if the hypotheses are false, then the implication is true by default. Okay, so now our assumption is that, well, both phi and phi implies psi are true. And you can see that from the truth table that the only case where this holds is uh, this row here. So in all the other rows, we either have that uh, phi is false down here, or in this row here, phi is true, but uh, the implication is false. So if A is a model for both of these formulas, then in fact we have to be in this case. And you see that in this case, well, it's just a single case, and in this case, um, psi is true. So from truth tables, uh, we conclude uh, that A must also be a model for psi. So if you wanted to be even more precise about this, you wouldn't just write down the truth table, you would argue with like this a star of phi and a star of uh, phi implies psi. But again, those definitions for the extension a star are just uh, directly encoding the truth table definition. So we can kind of just um, write things down a bit easier if we think about truth tables. Okay, so let's review what we've done. We've uh, taken a derivation of height k, whose last rule is this elimination rule for implication. Well, then it must have this form by the, the rule. And then we have these two subderivations, d1 and d2. We, uh, well, concluded that the assumptions for both of these have to be a subset of gamma. So gamma is the gamma occurring here. So all of the assumptions of the derivation d, so this entire thing must lie in gamma, and in particular, every assumption occurring in either of these two sets of assumptions has to also lie in gamma. Now we want to prove this semantic sequence here that gamma models the formula psi. So we select some arbitrary model A of the set gamma. Now because delta 1 and delta 2 are subsets of gamma, it means that A is also a model for each of these. And hence, by induction, on, well, the height of these derivations that occur here, which have height strictly less than k, we now know that the theorem holds, well, for these derivations d1 and d2. So we can conclude that, well, if a is a model for, let's say, delta 1, then also a has to be a model for the conclusions of the derivation d1, which in this case is phi. And similarly, in the case of d2, so because a is a model of delta 2 and soundness holds for d2, we conclude that A also has to be a model for this implication, phi implies psi. Hence, A overall is a model for both phi and also for phi implies psi. And the only case where this can occur, that both phi and phi implies psi are true, is if also psi itself is true. And therefore, A also has to be a model for psi, and this shows uh, soundness for, for D. Okay, so that uh, covers this case here. We now move on to the last case, which we'll consider, which is the reductio ad absurdum rule. So suppose that the last rule that we applied was RAA. So then D has to have uh, the following form. So just remember what the rule is for uh, reductio ad absurdum. So we have some subderivation D prime here that derives an absurdity from some a set of assumptions, gamma, together with the assumption that, uh, let's say, not psi holds, okay? And now we can apply RAA to conclude that, in fact, well, if we derive an absurdity from uh, gamma plus the assumption not psi, then, in fact, psi itself must hold. And in this process, we're again allowed to discharge this assumption like so. So overall, D is a derivation of uh, the formula psi from assumptions in gamma. 
but this subderivation d prime here has the additional assumption, or possibly has the additional assumption of not um, sine. Okay, so uh, we know again that d prime um, has height strictly less than k. and um, has assumptions uh, in the set uh, gamma union not psi. Now again, we know that soundness holds for d prime, and we now want to prove uh, soundness for d. So soundness for d says that, well, if we have such a uh, derivation, like the one we just uh, wrote down, then we need to show that every model of gamma is also a model of psi. So we let A be a model uh, of gamma. Now by induction, uh, we know uh, that every model let's call it every model B, of the set uh, gamma union not psi, like so, um, is a model um, of absurdity. However, the absurdity symbol here doesn't have any models because by definition its truth value is always false. So regardless of what truth values you assign to all of the atomic propositions occurring in your signature, the truth value of the formula just containing absurdity will always be false. And this means that this formula here is false in every sigma structure. So in particular, this means that if you have a model of uh, this set here, well, then it should be a model of this absurdity symbol, but that can't happen. And so therefore this set here doesn't have any models either. Okay, so since, uh, well, B star of absurdity is equal to false, uh, this is a contradiction. So hence uh, the set gamma union uh, not psi has no models. Okay, so that's something we can learn from the inductive hypothesis. We now want to use this fact to show that the sigma structure A, which is a model for gamma, also has to be a model for the formula psi. So suppose that um, A is not a model um, for the formula psi. So what does this mean? Well, then A star of psi has to be false, right? Um, so in turn, A star of not psi, this formula here would be true. And well, this would make, so this would mean that A is a model for well, it's a model for all the formulas in gamma, but now it's also a model for not psi. So overall, A would then be a model for this uh, set gamma unioned with the formula not psi. However, we just argued before that this set here can't have any models. So A being a model of the set is a contradiction. And so therefore, um, a must be a model um, of the formula psi. Okay, and with that we've also covered this case here. So just to recap, uh, we assume that the last rule we introduced is this reductio ad absurdum rule, then our derivation has this form here. In particular, we have this subderivation d prime, which derives absurdity from uh, assumptions occurring in the set gamma unioned with not psi. Now because soundness holds for the derivation d prime because it has strictly lower height than d, we know that well every model of this set of assumptions that we have for d prime will also be a model for its conclusions which is absurdity. However absurdity itself doesn't have uh, any models and therefore also this set uh, occurring up here can't have any models. 
And in particular, this means that if we choose any model of gamma, that uh, model can't additionally be a model for uh, the formula not psi. This then implies that if we take any model A of gamma, it can't also be the case that not psi is true in that uh, model. Otherwise, you would have such a non-existing model for the set gamma union not psi. And well, if not psi is not allowed to be true, then also the value of psi is not allowed to be false. So in other words, the truth value of psi has to be true in A, otherwise you would get such a non-existent model for absurdity. Okay, so with that, I'm going to conclude the proof. So in principle, in order for this proof to be complete, you would have to check all of the other natural deduction rules as well. However, the pattern for the remaining rules is basically the same as for the rules we've seen here. So you always start with a derivation that has the, the rule you're investigating as its last rule. Then in the natural deduction rule, you always have certain sub-derivations occurring. So for those sub-derivations, you get to assume by induction that soundness holds. And then you need to leverage that information um, to show that every model of the assumptions, well, you have in the original derivation D, so every model of gamma also is going to be a model for the conclusions you derive using that natural deduction rule. And essentially these arguments mirror the, the reasons I gave for why these uh, rules make sense in the previous videos. But if you want to do it formally, then you well use this language of being a model and so on. So if you want, I'd encourage you to treat it as an exercise to prove some of the remaining cases. So you would just pick an additional natural deduction rule that I haven't covered here and try to write down a proof along these lines that covers that case.